Hi, welcome to Get Used To It. I'm Sheila James Kuehl, your host or hostess, depending on which you'd like to choose. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, an issue that is much talked about in our community concerning other folks, but very rarely talked about concerning us, uh, and that's substance abuse. Um, I'm very pleased today to have three uh, informative and experienced uh, people on the show, and I'd like you to meet them. This is Kathy Watt, who is the executive director of the Van Ness Recovery House. Welcome, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you're here. Thanks. Uh, Susan Chassine, who is the executive director of the Alcoholism Center for Women. Welcome, Susan. Thanks for having me, Cheryl. Good that you're here. And Dr. Kevin Williams, who's a physician in private practice at the Pacific Oaks Medical Group. Welcome, Thanks. Kevin. Thank you. Well, this is a subject that people have a lot of trouble um, talking about, uh, although they'll always talk about their friends who have a problem or their family who has a problem. Uh, very difficult for people to talk about themselves who have a problem. Um, let's talk to you first, Susan, about, tell us a little about the Alcoholism Center for Women. It's a program that's special for lesbians, although we're open to all women. It was founded in 1974 out of some federal money. At the time, it was one of the largest grants that had ever been made to a women's program. And it really has provided a unique setting where lesbians can get services without having to face some of the homophobia that they might feel in other settings, and where women who are not lesbian or who aren't sure who they are can be in a safe environment that's grounded in respect for women. How, how old is the service? Been around a long time? Yeah, since 74. Uh, I think that the residential program started first and then some non-residential services. We have what we call an out-participant program to emphasize that each woman is really a part of her own treatment. She's not being acted on by others. A lot of times when we talk about substance abuse, people go right away to what they would consider, you know, the bad drugs and rarely talk about alcohol, although in our community there's been a, a growing consciousness, I think, about it. And I kind of wanted to start with this particular drug. Um, how do you think this affects our community in a, any particular way or are the relationship of our gay and lesbian community to alcohol and, and recovery? Well, we're getting ready to do a program about the extent of problems with substances in the community, and one of the panels is called Stonewall Was a Bar. And it really has a lot to do with where we first felt comfortable coming out and socializing, and, and to this day where a lot of people find the, the roots of their identity in being able to be around other people who are openly gay. So that's one of the sources of the, of the issue. It may also have to do with the fact that we reject a lot of roles, and so we're not so worried about what the neighbors think or what uh, somebody's going to say about us if we come home uh, under the influence. So there's a kind of a devil may care, we're on the edge anyway, let's uh, just party and have a good time. So the real, the, well, it's true, I guess people don't see alcohol always as a major problem. They, they might see it as a, a way that we all kind of loosen up and yeah. you know, talk to each other and it, we're it, in our own world. There's definitely a component of dealing with some of the internalized homophobia that we have, of being able to relax in a social setting where there aren't any rules. We're not sure who, who asks who to dance or how are we going to get home and then what are we going to do if we get there. So many, many uh, gay and lesbian people have never had sex except under the influence, for example. Mm. So how do you think this has a particular impact on lesbians? Is, well, there, is there a difference? Yeah, we think that lesbians' drinking patterns are more different than general women in the population than, say, gay men's drinking patterns are different from men in the general population. It may be, again, some of the, the rejection of the female passive role and not having to be a lady or something like that. Or there may be some other factors going on, but we do see that lesbians really use alcohol at rates that are both early and heavy and prolonged. So you start drinking young. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, part of it must be to make it go away, make that gayness go away, or, I mean, we, you know, we kind of talked about <clears throat> uh, self-medication in a lot of different ways in our society, but uh, do you think that's kind of what's going on? Oh, I definitely do. Uh, people 
who are not sure what's happening with their lives. I mean, a few of us wake up one day and say, well, I know I'm different and I know what it's all about. But very, very few, really. I think that there's a process, especially for women, that coming out takes years and uh, is an uncomfortable process still in most situations. So something, I think that the roots of substance abuse have to do with the fact that the substances work for us. They make us relax and feel good. And so to be able to manage your discomfort in a reliable way is, is really a marvelous thing. But the trouble is that it has consequences down the line that we, we don't understand when we start out. What kind of consequences? Well, there's physical effects of always being under the influence or being under the influence on a regular basis because it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. You know, you, you, you get those good feelings at the expense of, of some other feelings. And so you tend to see people whose baseline goes lower and lower over time, that they're on an ordinary basis, they're a little bit depressed. And their reactions, of course, are affected, reaction time and functioning. There's such a thing as tolerance so that you may not know that a person is under the influence. They may not be slurring their speech or falling down because they've acquired the um, habit so slowly that they've been able to adjust and, and compensate. So uh, the people who, who really look affected may not be the ones who have the biggest problem. So some toll on your body, what else? Well, relationships. If you're under the influence, you're not dealing with who you are and the other people can't either. One thing that happens for lesbians, I think there's the misconception that not very many of us have kids, but as a matter of fact, the rates of parenthood are about the same in the lesbian community as for the rest of the community. And parenting is a very tough thing, especially if you're a single parent and being a, a gay person or a lesbian, you're not an approved parent. So being under the influence with relation to the kids, uh, y they don't know who you are. You're uh, handling some of the stress of being a single parent or being a parent, but it's not really authentic. It's interesting when you said um, um, this is what you might be feeling. You might want to, you know, self-medicate uh, at the expense of other feelings, and that actually, I think, is also the case. Um, this is a way to hold down whatever sense you might have of shame. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose, as you said, an effective way, though the cost down the line is so uh, extraordinary that if you think cumulatively about all the drunks in our community and the loss of, uh, of all that potential and all of that, uh, you know, fulfillment, um, it seems like it's an extraordinary toll I don't mean to sound selfish because I, I love this community so much, but an extraordinary toll on the community too. Um, but it's so accepted. Uh, so what brings someone to uh, ACW? Well, some of our women come directly off of a very bad experience such as a rape or, or identifying that they have no place to live, they're homeless or they're on the streets. Uh, other people get to a, what we would call a bottom, but another way through a job that tells them they have to change or a court sends them to us. Uh, sometimes people are released from jail and told, get yourself some treatment be, or go, go back. It's a condition of their release. Well, I'm, I'm glad you're there. Um, Kevin, tell me, is there any difference with, uh, with the men in our community? I think there are some differences and, and quite a lot of similarities in, uh, in the root causes of, of why uh, people use substances. Um, I, I think one of the big differences in, in the gay male community is that there is a, um, uh, there's a higher degree of sexuality that's involved in a lot of, of drug use in the gay community. Um, you know, there was a uh, there was this whole period of sexual liberation in the 70s and the early 80s and um, a lot of uh, a lot of the crystal use I think that's happening nowadays is is kind of a reaction against this period that we went through in the mid 80s where because of HIV um, lots of uh, you know, it was taboo to be uh, to be out there and to be sexual and to be involved in uh, in different relationships and being promiscuous and so now uh, there's kind of a backlash against that and uh, people are tired of 
uh, of suppressing you know, that desire, and they use the crystal as a, as a means of saying, it's okay, you know, I can do it, because, because I'm under the influence, and I'm not responsible for my actions. It gives them permission to do that. It, it sounds very familiar in terms of alcohol or marijuana or anything where people, mm -hmm. it's, it's as though we take our responsibility and say, okay, here's who I am without the drugs or alcohol, now I'll put the responsibility on the drugs or alcohol to free me up mm -hmm. to do. But there's a really um, evil undercurrent, really, in, in what you've said, one that's very uh, distressing. And I've heard at a number of AIDS conferences um, this backlash, as you referred to it, mm -hmm. this notion that the, the central meaning of gayness was about sexual liberation. It was a, mm -hmm. a way of rebelling, but it wasn't only about roles. It was about uh, striking out against this uh, sexophobic society mm -hmm. and saying, this is, this is a good thing that we're doing. We are the right. liberators of society mm -hmm. by our actions. And then comes AIDS, right. which is exactly the uh, uh, kind of the, the opposite force, mm -hmm. saying, you know, you think that this is what you're going to be about, but now you have to risk death if you're going to be about that. Right, exactly. Or you have to change. You have to do something else. Mm -hmm. And the only ways we could think of to change were essentially safe sex. I mean, we mm -hmm. haven't thought of another way to change. So here's an entire community either dying or practicing safe, safe sex. sex. And mm -hmm. what you're saying is that we, we've heard that there's a, uh, an epidemic of crystal mm -hmm. use, that it's really about this backlash? I think to a large extent it is about this backlash. Um, I think, you know, the other reasons that, uh, that come into play are, are reasons of self-esteem, reasons of, uh, of, of self-worth, um, of being able to, you know, some of the same reasons that people use alcohol in order to be able to feel liberated, to feel like they can talk to people, that they can uh, be more gregarious, be uh, more lively, that it unleashes the real them. And uh, there's a lot of, there is a lot of internalized homophobia and a lot of uh, self-esteem issues in the gay male population, particularly when you're dealing in a, um, uh, in a city like Los Angeles where uh, being out and uh, being uh, one of the in crowd and being, uh, you know, and going to the gym and all of those things seem to matter so much. Um, there's a lot of, uh, uh, people have a lot of, of, of issues of, of, of value, of, of their own self-worth, and because they see everybody around them who seems to be so gregarious and so happy and so out there, and so I think they use the crystal as a way of, of equaling that, of being on that level also. Well, it's, it's interesting, there's a real dichotomy in, in terms of how, of using substance to deal with internalized homophobia, because if you're homophobic, you would hate being gay, or hate yourself for being gay, but you are gay. So the drugs really allow you to live out something that you hate mm -hmm. without taking responsibility for it. And, but people are very worried about this. What's, what are the dangers in it? I don't mean to sound naive, but um, what are the dangers in this? Well, crystal. Um, uh, and you know, crystal is only one of, of many drugs that are pretty rampant right now. It, you know, to me, it's the most insidious because uh, it is, uh, it's a very seductive drug. The high uh, is very intense, um, and uh, people feel very powerful on it. Um, but you know, what tends to happen is because it's, it's fairly long-acting, uh, people will go on binges that, will, that may last for days on end. Um, and you know, during that time, not only are they subjected to the effects of the crystal, which is an amphetamine, um, so you know, things such as jitteriness and palpitations and uh, increased blood pressure, you know, um, with long-term usage, they can develop uh, paranoia and anxiety. And uh, uh, there's a tremendous, um, there's a tremendous come down when you come off of the crystal. Uh, people become extremely depressed, and uh, you know may stay in bed for days. And uh, and and one of the reasons why they go on binges and why they continue to use is to avoid that depression to avoid that coming down and so people end up not only uh, having the side effects of the crystal but then that leads them into other um, other behaviors that are not healthy for instance they don't sleep they don't eat properly they don't uh, drink enough fluids and you know and 
if you look at the sub-segment of the population that's HIV positive, that's, that's really deadly. Uh, if you're not taking, enough, not taking good care of yourself and getting enough rest and eating properly. So it becomes a very lethal drug. There's a lot of fatalism though. I mean, when you say it's deadly, Someone who's HIV positive may be smiling to himself at this very minute watching the show, mm -hmm. thinking, yeah, deadly. Um, right. What isn't deadly? Right. You know, life is deadly to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I was also interested in some things that you had said about uh, men who are negative in the community. We've also heard about um, a, a, a sort of a psychological backlash on their part. Mm -hmm. Will you say more yeah, about I think that? Yeah, I think that also is really true. There's. Uh, um, there's a sense of fatalism, certainly, that I, that I hear uh, amongst uh, people who are HIV negative. One, that, uh, that it's going to happen to them eventually. Um, and I think that the crystal uh, allows them to, uh, um, to, to let that happen. In some ways, they, you know, they want it. They feel, they feel guilt. Um, about the fact that they've remained negative while all of their friends and all the people around them are positive. And uh, I think the crystal allows them to, uh, you know, to expose themselves to risky situations that they feel you know, they, they deserve to be in and that, and that it's going to happen to them anyway. And not just unsafe sex, you're talking about other kind of risky. Yeah. I mean, even though that's a very risky... Even though that's a very risky situation, um, you know, they uh, also will put themselves at, uh, at tremendous physical harm and, and danger with, uh, in, in different situations. Um, uh, you know, just, just physical violence, uh, extremely rough sexual practices, uh, you know, um, a lot of S&M bondage type things that, that really uh, can cause a lot of physical harm. Well, it, it may be too strong for me to say so, but I, it sounds to me like a form of suicide. I mean, certainly high-risk behavior yeah. is like uh, Russian roulette in a way. And um, this is a community with a very high degree of suicide, especially mm -hmm. among our young people, mm -hmm. as we are learning more and more. Uh, and I, I don't know whether you'd agree with the opinion, but especially for men who say, might as well get over zero converting, um, gonna happen anyway, or I shouldn't be the only, you know, survivor's guilt. Mm -hmm. um, it, it seems to all tie together for me with the, with the internalized and external mm -hmm. homophobia. Yeah. It's hard for us to live in the world. And this is an answer true. that people choose. Mm -hmm. um, but you seem to be, I mean, I hate to say, but we all seem to be in the rescue business here. <laughs> is, is rescue possible? I mean, oh. what, yeah. what happens? Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, rescue is very possible. Um, <laughs> It takes uh, it takes a tremendous amount of will on the, on the person, uh, and it's not easy. It's it's not easy at all. Crystal is a very difficult uh, drug to uh, to get off of, and I have uh, you know had many patients who have had multiple relapses before finally being able to quote unquote kick the habit, um, and you know a, a lot of it comes from uh, really wanting. To make a change, and, uh, and also from getting some some psychotherapeutic intervention to help them, you know, along that path. Um, you know, I think that's really that's really critical. I mean, one of the uh, the things that we had talked about is that uh, in order to deal with the addiction, you really have to deal with some of the root causes of, of where the addiction comes from. And unless people, you know, are willing to look at that, and sometimes that can be very difficult. It's 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 hard to look at yourself and to see your unhappiness and, and where that comes from. But unless people are willing to do that or able to do that, it's very difficult to kick the addiction. But for those who can do that, it, it's very rewarding. Well, and sometimes, of course, what you have to do when you do kick the addiction is you begin on your very first steps of looking at yourself. Yeah. Although, when you see the monster that you thought you were, it often turns out you're not that much of a monster. Yeah. It's kind of a relief it's to true. find out. Kathy, what do you, what do you see in, uh, at Van Ness House? I guess we run the rescue mission. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope so. <laughs> crystal, crystal rescue mission. Um, you know, so many of our men and women have used alcohol or drugs to even get the courage to go to the bars mm -hmm. as gay men and lesbians. Um, and it is the homophobia and it's theirs and what they see out there. Um, the crystal use is rampant. Uh, there's no doubt what it's doing in our community. And we see the people whose lives have kind of come to a halt. There's really nowhere for them to go. It's like they didn't die. 
which for many of them is, is a sad thing to realize. And recovery and having these doors open to them is not what their choice was. Their choice was out. So we jump that hurdle with them and, and, uh, and, and try to move forward. And, and like was said earlier, there's a lot of relapse with Crystal. Um, you know, so it's kind of advanced what we do is try to establish a home where they will feel safe to come back and tell us what's going on free of judgment. We try to build a home that is different than the home they believe they grew up in. As they stay sober over time, many of our residents realize they ran away before their families had a chance to throw them away. And uh, many of them, as we can build the bridges back to their family, we get the support. But what we do initially is just try to build a safe place for them to tell us the truth about what's going on and give them to some skills to go out and, and exist in this world rather than compete. You know, the gay community and especially the men and, and here where we live, it's so competitive. I mean, the body's got to be the certain shape and the clothes have to be a certain kind and, you know, you got to look that certain look and uh, unfortunately crystal fuels that ability like we said you know you can go you cannot eat for a lot of days and if you go to the gym every day and you don't eat every day and you do a little crystal you can achieve that look that is seemingly the look that this community is about and uh, and it's not true you know we are all sizes shapes and everything and, uh, you know, that's what I hope people get to hear and, and that whatever they're using the drugs and alcohol for, they don't need to. You can, you can be who you are and, and make it in this community without the drugs and alcohol, but they just, they provide such a buffer. Well, it's funny, there's, a, there's an interesting crossover to me, and again, I always tread a little bit on thin ice about this stuff, but women were always and still always are so apparently concerned about ha achieving a certain look, a model's look. And the men in our community seem to have adopted that notion, <laughs> looksism, um, that is not necessarily, I mean, it has its own kind of flavor, but because it, it's not essentially feminine, but it really is about what makes you valuable in your society. And for so many years, that's was the truth for women. You had to look a certain way, that was your only value. And to adopt that kind of sort of negative approach. In the flip side, um, when we were talking about um, alcohol, and I assume crystal and other drugs as well, what, what, uh, how has it acted out in the lesbian community? Secretly where so many women for so long and lesbians drank in the bars or drank at home. I mean, and I think a lot more at home than in the bars. I mean, and just by, I mean, there's one lesbian bar here in town and there's 10 men's bars and certainly there's the same number of lesbians looking for treatment as there is gay men, so they're clearly drinking somewhere. But what Crystal's doing is, Crystal, there are many lesbian underground bars and when we talked about earlier the sex that men are having on crystal, women are doing the same thing, S&M, bondage, and the different kinds of sex that crystal gives them the freedom to have is very risky and very scary because it's putting lesbians at risk of transmission that at least at the Van Ness house and what we've heard prior to crystal wasn't going on. You know, the women are just doing high-risk sex and, and lesbians weren't doing that, you know, four, five, six years ago. But Crystal gives you a freedom to do things sexually that, you know, really no drug before it. And, it's, and this mix of Crystal that we have, I mean, it's amphetamines. It's been around a long time, but uh, it's created a sexual freedom that is just putting people at risk. And lesbians, I mean, it's... Uh, well, that's the same, uh, it's fun, that's the flip side of the emulation factor, in a sense, I yeah. guess. Mm -hmm. For so long, they were telling us, you know, lesbians really need to lighten up about sex. I mean, this is the problem <laughs> that women have. They're so uptight about it, and they really need to do something about this. Well, apparently, women are getting the message, but not internally really able 
to go that far. Mm -hmm. And so this hyper-masculinity notion of you know, pushing the edge of the envelope and being very sexual and all those things that actually a lot of men are rejecting mm -hmm. these days, women are now way late in history right. adopting and emulating. And this seems to be connected to me where you're freed up to do all these things that are really mm -hmm. essentially bad for you and, and really cost the community enormously. Well, and the rate of abuse, I mean, lesbian battering and abuse that goes on around alcohol and, and, and drugs too, but alcohol, I mean, you know, we don't talk about lesbians. We don't talk about what lesbians do. And, uh, you know, there is, the amount of abuse is, I don't know what the percentage is, but it's high. I don't know how many. Well, the, the uh, Gay Community Services Center here told me the other day that half of the people that come into them for counseling, men and women, are dealing with domestic abuse in gay and lesbian relationships. Well, you know, that's, it's actually a subject I know a lot about, having worked in the issues for 20 years or so. And a lot of people blame their violence on drugs or alcohol, which we've generally rejected because you actually talked about, f all of you, freeing up people taking away inhibitions. Well, if your inhibitions are taken away, you are your real self. You're doing what you really want to do. Not necessarily, though, because one of the things that happens with alcohol and, and I think with uh, meth, uh, there's an irritant quality. Uh, it's as if the drug gets in there and puts us on edge in a different way. I, I really don't, I think it's dangerous to think that the person under the influence is themselves. S they've lost some inhibition, but they've gotten some other stuff that is, is acting there too. So it's, it's really not necessarily uh, either person. I mean, you have to kind of get sober to find out who the person is, which <laughs> is another concept. <laughs> is the scary part for some people. <laughs> We're gonna take a break and we'll be right back. Don't go away because this just gets more and more interesting. Last night I met the most incredible girl. So sexy the way she held her cigarette. Her clothes reeked of tobacco. Her fingernails were kind of yellow. Later we kissed. It was like licking an ashtray. And then she whispered the sweetest thing in my ear. <coughs> <coughs> I think I'm in love. This is 911 operator 224, what's your emergency? We need an ambulance, oh my god, my boyfriend, I think he's gonna okay, die! Okay, please try to calm down. He's unconscious, he's bleeding, he's going to I need to get some information from you, okay? Okay, hurry! Okay, where are you? Uh, at the Cornell Hollywood and Wilcox. An ambulance is on the way. Stay on the line, tell me what happened. He just started freaking out, smiling fingers, and he put his fist through the window, and now he's bleeding. Okay, was he using any drugs? Yes. Do you know what he took? Oh, it's his speed. Okay, how much did he take? I'm not sure. We got an ambulance going oh, over there right now. Please. Hi, welcome back to Get Used To It. I'm Sheila Kuehl, your host, and today we're talking about substance abuse. Uh, my guests, whom uh, I hope you met earlier, are um, Kathy Watt from uh, Van Ness Recovery House, uh, Susan Chassin from the Alcoholism Center for Women, and Dr. Kevin Williams, uh, who practices at Pacific Oaks. Uh, well, we've talked a lot about crystal. We've talked quite a bit about alcohol. We haven't said a word about pot. That nice drug, that safe drug, that medicinal drug, what do you think? It's Anybody, one, jump one in. One of my favorite subjects because uh, <clears throat> I came up when marijuana was really gathering popularity and uh, thought nobody could get addicted and believed that if the system was telling me it was bad, it was probably good. And I see a lot of that denial all around us. And even in some people who are recovering, they think they can safely maintain with marijuana. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't usually work. Right. That's the scary thing that I see is so many people who have relapsed. I mean, they've been sober for any period of time, some of them a long time. So many relapses are t tried, tied to pot. They think they can just smoke a little bit and maintain. And as rampant as, uh, as crystal and alcoholism is, I mean, pot is so pervasive in the community. You know, I used to think that there was a, um, uh, that there was a difference between uh, substance use and substance abuse. And, you know, more and more I'm seeing that, 
you know, that's, that substance use really eventually leads down the road to abuse. It really is just a slippery slope. And I think that pot, in many ways, starts people down that slippery slope. Well, our enemies in the right wing have been the ones talking all the time about how, you know, smoke a joint and the next thing you know, you're going to be a complete drug addict. And I think it's made us wary of the anti-drug message because it was always linked with those same folks who were anti giving us anti-gay messages. Mm -hmm. And so not only pushing the edge of the envelope, but also doubting. Right. And that's, I think, why it's so important, why I wanted you here on this show, because we're all gay and lesbian people here. Mm -hmm. We care about the community, and we're saying this is a slippery slope. And I, I think the truth of that message has to come out. Yeah. Do you agree? Absolutely. I mean, uh, Marijuana is more like alcohol than any other drug, in mm -hmm. my opinion, both yeah. because it's so widely available and it's socially acceptable. There are people who use it on a regular basis and don't seem to progress uh, either to have major impairments or to have problems. There are so heavy social drinkers or regular social drinkers who don't drive under the influence and don't get into battering. So at that level, it's a value judgment. You're, you're, you're physically and mentally having some effects, but if they're not getting in the way of some major life experience, it's up to you. If you want to experience life on life's terms, it's fine to stop. But, you, you know, nobody's going to tell you if you're not having any problems that you, I'm not going to tell you that you shouldn't use it for a, a value judgment. But it does creep up over time. And a marijuana particularly stays in the body for a long time, it, it hangs out in the fat cells. And even if you're off for a few days, you're still not completely clear of it. It takes people who've been smoking it for years, six months to a year to get it out of their systems. And especially now, the pot that's on the streets is so much more potent than the pot of years before. <laughs> I mean, they've perfected all these ways of growing it and breeding it or whatever they're doing, that it's so potent. And so it's going to change how long people are able to use it without seemingly having anything go wrong, too, because it's just not the same drug it was 10 years out there. And I think that's very scary. Well, I want to talk a little bit about recovery. I mean, we, we seem to be pretty much in agreement that um, the best thing to be is sober. And, uh, of course, looking from the other side of that wall, at getting sober, it doesn't look like it's the best thing to be. It's hard to envision um, life without that. But on the other side of the wall, it's very much like coming out to me, where you think, oh, I, could, I couldn't do this. Everyone will hate me. It'll be awful. Then you do it, and everyone says, it was the best thing I did for myself, you know, was coming out. And sobriety is like that, too. Um, but it's hard to know. Uh, is there something the community can do to help the individual? I think our community is very aware of the impact that drugs and alcohol have had on certain friends. We all have a friend that we can say, yeah, and they got sober and it really changed their life. But those are the people who we really see that hit a bottom. But there are lots of people who are functioning that really have that same level of drug addiction or alcoholism, but they're just managing to move fast enough to keep it together. And, and I think in our community it's becoming more acceptable to be sober, so it's getting easier for those people to look at their lives honestly and say, wow, maybe I better do something. And, and I think Susan can talk about really where we're going with prevention and a new, we kind of have this new, we have a new commission. Yeah, we do? Project, yeah. Yeah, we, we believe that the community uh, can take responsibility for our environment and start shaping it the way we want it to be. Uh, some of that has to do with friends saying to friends, I'm concerned about you on an individual level, but some of it has to do with things like festivals and how alcohol is served in bars and clubs. And so we're beginning something in Los Angeles called the Community Prevention Council mm. for the lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender communities. Now, clearly transgender people do not always consider themselves part of the gay community, but uh, they have some of the same issues uh, 
in terms of discrimination and and we're open to them if they want to be a part of it mm -hmm. so uh, that's a very exciting project it's going to have a kickoff on uh, march 12th and then at the beginning of gay pride week we'll be presenting some of the results back from a needs assessment that uh, we're doing now say more about ways that the community supports drug and alcohol use i mean i you know, one of the things that, that we had talked about um, was uh, how uh, how the uh, the alcohol uh, sponsors have so infiltrated into you know gay and lesbian events. How you look at something like the AIDS ride, which is sponsored by Tanqueray, right. and you you see that there is a tremendous amount of support uh, from uh, the different uh, alcohol companies in this community. And one way. I think of uh, you know of the community um, uh, dealing with the issues of drug and alcoholism is you know is to look for the sponsors to look for other people to sponsor their events. Right, it's not just Tangare. You look on the back page of any of our magazines, Absolutes. Mm -hmm. There, you look on the back page of the Lesbian News, and it's Stoli. Um, they know that we're a big uh, market, I mm -hmm. guess, yeah. for these products. That's unfortunate. But they also came in at a time and, and offered money to agencies to be able to to sponsor them to do events that that have become very important and and I don't think it's and it's funny being the one from the recovery house but I don't think it's necessarily them as much as we have to have an alternative if we're going to accept that money if we're going to say yes Tanqueray come and, and bring what you bring we also need to have a responsibility to provide non-alcoholic for those who, who choose not to drink. Um, I think we, we can say most all of them have a counterpart that is a non-alcohol beverage. Mm -hmm. And to say, bring that with you too. I, I, having to raise the amount of money that I have to raise to keep us going, I'm, I believe that it's great that we get that money. I, I think it comes on our part to figure out how to have it become more responsible and say to people, we're not telling you to drink. It's kind of more of the education. Um, Tanqueray doesn't sponsor it so that everybody will become a, a Tanqueray drinker. I, I really don't believe that. I believe they want to help us. And yes, they get something out of it. But I think there's other <laughs> people we can bring in. OK, guess what, Susan? I know. <laughs> well, yeah, I well I, I think they do want everybody to uh, to see them in a positive light and uh, brand loyalty gets Absolutely. established and so right. but I'm not mm. a to I, I would prefer it if the community didn't accept any alcohol subsidies at all just like I think that tobacco subsidies are not a good idea and we haven't talked about tobacco which is another drug of abuse and people it's interesting because people are beginning to be so critical of the tobacco industry now that we know what they know and what they didn't tell us. Well, the alcohol industry knows that something like 90% of the quantity of alcohol gets consumed by a small percentage of people who are likely to have problems. It's not just a neutral thing. Their, their market share comes out of the heavy drinkers. And they want people to think that it's a normal part of life. And so anyway, that's a little bit of a soapbox. But I do agree with Kathy, it isn't an all or nothing thing. I might advocate that we not accept alcohol subsidies, but I'm willing to say if we do, let's not sell our, ourselves cheap. Let's put it in small letters, not above AIDS right. Ride, mm -hmm. not in a typeface that's as big as AIDS Ride or something like that. And let's have, like Kathy said too, other products, uh, things like sparkling water, the uh, San Francisco Gay Pride Festival right. last year had Calistoga as a sponsor. We mm -hmm. don't want to ignore the fact that when other beverages are available, people go for them, and it was very successful. In San Diego, Gay Pride limits the sale of alcohol to a beer garden, and people have to keep their containers in that area. So mm -hmm. there are ways to do it in a progressively more responsible and healthy uh, setting, all, uh, uh, apart from an all or nothing. Right. Well, the anti-tobacco um, movement got a big boost once we started saying, you know what, even if I don't smoke, secondhand smoke can kill me. And I think there needs to be more <coughs> consciousness about the impact of other substance abuse on the lives of people who are not abusing, on the victims of domestic violence, mm -hmm. on the people, you know, on the taxes that we pay for, you know, just to clean up accidents, um, and all that sort of thing. Or, I mean, I, I know of a, a horrific accident that happened during some of our worst rains this year up near Santa Barbara where 
a gay man who was impaired drove and killed somebody. And um, his, his friendship group, his family of choice, was in terrible denial. I know somebody who did raise it with him and had talked to him and you know, was able to say, at least after he died and, and he killed someone in the act, at least I said everything to him that I could. So, mm -hmm. right. See, I think that's my thing about the alcohol, and it's with anything. We take the, if we want, if we're going to take the money, we can set up parameters for taking that money. And if we say, give us space that is alcohol free, if you're mm -hmm. going to do this for us, if you're going to build this <coughs> festival, we want part of it to be so that people who choose not to be around the alcohol can be in the same environment. Um, so much of the socialization in this community has some form of alcohol with it. Um, and it's everywhere. And until we start making it okay for those who choose not to drink to have the same space and to feel just as safe as those drinking do in that space, we're, we're not going to get there. Because if I have to give up socializing, if I stop drinking, then I have to give up socializing, and that's the only way I get to go be gay, why, why am I going to stop? And so that's why I really think this, this whole prevention thing, once we get it going and can get it out there, we will open the doors for people to stop or to look at their behavior more because right now there's not a lot of alternatives if you're not out except maybe at night or on the weekends when you can go be social here mm -hmm. we don't have a lot of alternatives for you yeah you know one of the things just getting back to um what we as a community can do. It's one of the things I think that we can be better at is at policing ourselves. You know, one of the one of the interesting ironies I find in life is uh, uh, when you look at something like, uh, for instance, uh, the gay men's health crisis, uh, their their mourning party they have every year in New York. Uh, that you know there was uh, uh, an article about the rampant drug use at at that type of an event, and it's just it's very interesting that you have an event whose uh, purpose is to raise money for AIDS and AIDS care and AIDS prevention, but yet there's such rampant drug use, and we know all the you know, all the problems with drug use. And, the, and what it leads people into doing. So, you know, what we need to do is police ourselves better and say, you know, at these, you know that, that this isn't acceptable, you know, that we can't have these types of events. Well, like any other victims who are in pain, I mean, we use it as an excuse. And this community is not well and is not great on its own self-esteem as a community. Right. I mean, we reflect the individuals in the community. And I... Um, I guess I feel more uh, I, I feel more strongly about alcohol-free places. I mean, I think that anti-tobacco folks have been really appropriately obnoxious <laughs> about it, and they've been very successful. And we have yeah. changed a mindset about it out there because we've said, you know, I want a law that this doesn't go on here, mm -hmm. and I want it, you know, pushed further and further and further, which we've managed to do somewhat with alcohol. If we did that in the community, if we were harsh about it, socialization is different from addiction. Mm -hmm. right. If you want to go somewhere and socialize, and you want it to not have alcohol there right. for you, that's something we can do mm -hmm. as a community. Mm -hmm. You know, sure. I think you told an interesting story okay. about um, conflict with the neighborhood, too, mm -hmm. about a well, bar. If it's part of that, but the other part that kind of really shows that you can do it in West Hollywood, I, I really believe there are more 12-step meetings than <laughs> any other city around. And what happened is the 12-step meetings grew, coffee houses grew. Hmm. And it's really interesting that now we have, I bet there's a coffee house for every two bars. Well, that's part of it. So many people became sober that one coffee house opened and here's an alcohol free place where we can go socialize and be with our people and it took off and so now there's another one so it can happen um, and and people need that I think uh, we've done that part but it needs to be on much greater levels I don't what else can we do well um, just talking about organizations I think if an organization would like to make a contribution, have an event 
that doesn't serve alcohol, you know, once a year or as often as you have one that does. If you're not prepared to go all the way, uh, Lesbianas Unidas here has adopted an, a policy that they don't serve alcohol at their events. Uh, and so there are a lot of, of I, I kind of, you said a few minutes ago, I don't know if you meant it, Sheila, but that our, our community is somehow sick or something. I think there's a lot of health hanging out. There are a lot more organizations where people find self-esteem and we're, we may be a little fragmented in that now there are groups for the lesbians in film and TV and there are, you know, the, the, the gay librarians or scientists or the, the atheists and, you know, so we don't all get together maybe like in the beginning people had that unity. But um, wherever we are, there will be some substance abuse issues and people who are able to, to deal with them in some way will be making a contribution. Well, maybe we ought to um, see as an aspect of our community support. If we can't engage individuals and in, I don't know, I, I was thinking of, you know, of a pledge kind of thing to, uh, to do something or to say something or to go somewhere or whatever to help someone else um, get off whatever they're on. Because I don't know that people do it alone. Yeah. It's really hard to do it alone. I mean, that mm -hmm. to me is the value of knowing that there's somewhere to go. Um, at the end of this program, I want, I've asked each of you to bring uh, names and phone numbers. And as you know, watching in places that are not Los Angeles, these phone numbers uh, can still be called because some of them are going to be national numbers. Um, but there are places, I would think, everywhere that, uh, that we have community now that, that can help. Or at least we'll have the referrals for the people of where to go for help. Um, I think the important thing for that people could do to take your message there is for every, if you're going to go out with friends, make a commitment that we're going to go out and, and do a non-alcohol night. If we're going to go out this weekend and it's three or four people, let's go out to dinner and, and do it without alcohol. And as you start to see the differences in conversation and in how your evening unfolds or your afternoon or your day, then you can get a perspective of what the alcohol or the drugs are doing. And then you might say, whoa. Because until you can at least get with a few friends and agree to do it together, like you said, alone it's not going to happen very often. But as they agree to kind of do it, okay, we're going to try this, the more that happens, or somebody will say, yes, I'm having a dinner party and we're not going to have alcohol, and, and get to see what those kind of events can be like without it, then, then some change will start to happen. But it's very true. It's not gonna, I don't think it'll happen alone. Well, it's, an, it's a different situation with Crystal. Um, at least it seems to be. And this is um, f from really what you have all said, uh, that the, the, the value of Crystal goes to um, really uh, lack of inhibition sexually, primarily, mm -hmm. uh, though not way. only, because you were talking about self-esteem, mm -hmm. the ability to, to be more vocal in public, mm -hmm. uh, etc. cetera. Um, how, do we, how do we help folks see that maybe those, v that valuing that activity and needing a crutch in order to engage, you know, satisfactorily in it is something they they need to leave behind. That's a really, really that's difficult. A tough one. That's a that's that's a very difficult one because because it really does require. I mean, I, I think a lot of um, uh, of soul searching and a lot of uh, of introspection, um, and to some extent, it requires a, a great deal of uh, of one on one on one of one on one work. Um, you know, I think that it is. Um, uh, it's much easier for us to, uh, you know, to be supportive, but it's 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 very difficult for uh, for the person who is involved in the whole crystal um, quote unquote lifestyle uh, to do it um, unless they unless they have professional help. And I think they really need to have uh, psychotherapeutic intervention and, and, and intervention with somebody who knows about drug addiction and about crystal addiction. I don't think that, that um, you know, just support of friends is, is enough alone. 
I think it's definitely beneficial, but I also have to say that finding a group of people who've been there mm -hmm. in terms of self-help yes. with 12-step with or some other form of self-help, it is so different for someone to be in a room with other people who've been there and hear from them that some of the same things that they never told anyone, and mm -hmm. so they know that, you know, That's true. that mm -hmm. they really have understood it. That. Uh, if you try to do it alone and don't get that kind of support, it can mm -hmm. be very difficult. Mm -hmm. But if you, and certainly if you combine the two, it's the best of all. Yeah. But if, if you don't have the money or, or can't immediately find a place uh, to get the skilled therapeutic help, find some folks in recovery and hopefully uh, they, some of them will have used the same drug so they'll have some of the same stories. The other mm -hmm. thing that, that I just think is very important to tell people is that when you stop, you're experiencing withdrawals, even if it's not a physical sh uh, symptom, that your cravings and your discomfort are part of the withdrawal and they go away because right. it's so tempting to think, oh, this is life without it. I <laughs> don't want any part of this. Right. And, and just as there are, as there are AA meetings out there, there are CMA meetings, Crystal Meth Anonymous meetings for people where they can go and get that support and be surrounded by people who've been through what they've been through. Mm -hmm. And I think the other part with crystal and, and being the sexual drug that it is, is the importance that we need to give people the space and we need to give gay men the space to talk about what they did give up sexually or what their minds are telling them that they had to give up sexually. And crystal's allowing them to do something that they think they had to give up. And then we have the message out there about safer sex, safer sex. Well, what if I don't have safer sex? You know, what if I slip up? What if I'm just tired of being safe? And I go, we, we don't have the space out there for, for men to tell the truth. And so mm -hmm. then crystal and or alcohol is a way to block those feelings of, oh, I didn't do it right. You know, and, and one of the things at the Van Ness House in our getting guys to give up crystal is for them to tell the truth about what crystal allowed them to do and then to engage in the conversations about healthy sex and that they're not the only ones who who had these ideas they did and and to give them the freedom and the okay to talk about it i i don't believe with all the work we did on safer sex we ever gave men and or women the places to talk about how difficult it was or if we didn't do it perfect whatever that is for mm -hmm. the individual and so then one more time we have a reason for drugs and alcohol to block those feelings of shame and uh, I think it doesn't matter I mean I if you're sober or whatever if you can find somebody that you can confide in those secrets that you're beating yourself up for around sex and that and with crystal that you can eventually get to a place where you will be able to have enjoyable great sex without crystal but not until you talk about the stuff you've done on it mm -hmm. because it is it, it creates such a fantasy I mean I to try to just stop and think okay now great no crystal how am I gonna have sex this weekend I, I really believe most guys would just choose to go get loaded again I mean mm -hmm. I think that's true I think they know, would we've got to Give them the space to talk about it and tell yeah. the truth, where this drug lets them go, and, and then how you can build a life without it. And, and that's true of any substance. I mean, mm -hmm. I, it, it's heightened perhaps, but a lot of women have histories of childhood sexual abuse that they ha don't even have a clue right. exist, much right. less having right. the memories. Right. Uh, and men have those experiences. We, we started out learning about women, but now we know men do too. Mm -hmm. right. And whatever the shame, um, the fact that that they're not the perfect mother, or that uh, they don't, they're not able to be superwoman, or that they've been on welfare and don't know where they're going to get a job, or any of the things that we think are so unique to ourselves. Ag again, in sharing with somebody else, and hopefully, eventually, with a group, or being able to come out about it, uh, it it's healing. And then, well, what was the big deal? You know. Well, I guess that's why I compared it to coming out, because of my own, you know, relief, really, at, and in an unexpected way of telling the truth. And it's the same with people who've talked about childhood sexual abuse, and finally, it's not a confession so much as it, what you said, it's, it's saying your story. 
Right. And having other people go, I get it. I've been there. I understand. Uh, and I think that's been the, the beauty of our community, because we've been so ghettoized, too, that we've had to do that, you know, to hear each other's stories and, and to say, I've been there, I get it. Um, well, I want to thank the three of you very, very much um, for being here today, and, um, and especially for telling the truth and trying to kind of elucidate what is really a, a pretty hidden aspect, I think, of our community. It's the one that we all know, but we don't talk about right. uh, too much. And today, we talked about it. Um, and if you're out there watching and you think that uh, this may in any way be about you, and you have even a random stray thought that you might like to do something about it, uh, we're going to publish some phone numbers at the end of this show. I want you to make that call uh, because the healthy life and the sober life is a great life and you can get used to it.